so just to kind of cover what we're going to go through, this is a basics orientation. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about the fundamentals of Inkscape and why you use it. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the things that really confused me as far as the fundamental tools for manipulating uh, objects and nodes, the, the foundations of Inkscape, and uh, some of the most commonly used tools, and then some advanced tools, time allowing. So this will depend on um, where we are. I'm going to try and keep it to an hour. Uh, afterwards, uh, we, people that want to have a little bit of practice can linger, and uh, even you can share your screens and I can give you some uh, comment that will hopefully help you move forward. So what is SVG? Uh, it's called, uh, it's, it's scalable vector graphics. This is, uh, XML is the description of the format in which it is organized. Uh, as you can see on this slide, there's a, uh, it's much like, uh, you can see it embedded inside of HTML here. And you see it starts with SVG, it defines the height and width of the uh, of the area that's being drawn, and then there's various different objects. In this case, we're doing a line, and it's giving some coordinates uh, for the starting point, some coordinates for the ending point, and then it has the style of the line. So the one interesting thing about SVG is that you could edit it by hand. You can you can literally create it, and uh, the Oh, uh, I need to, oh, I made the screen bigger so it'd be easier and now I can't access the link. Um, well, that's painful. Uh, so, well, it could pop, if the, we followed that link, it would uh, take us to an online editor where I could show you that changing the coordinates changes the, um, it changes the position of where the line shows up in the design. Um, so I'd love to hear uh, or see in text some examples of uh, tools in the makerspace that you know or have used uh, using Inkscape. Uh, so I will pop back over to the other thing for that. Oh. Uh, yep. Yeah. Use laser cutter. Uh, any other you want to use? Uh, so I, I heard CNC. I heard um, laser cutter. Water jet. Yep, that's the other one I was looking for to uh, do. So. Uh, you can see that we have a, uh, a bunch of these tools. Um, and the one that could be a little surprising to some folks is the, uh, it's the 3D printers, because you can actually do um, a, an object that's 2D and extrude it out into three dimensions. Um, so with the laser cutter, you're printing directly from Inkscape. Uh, with the vinyl cutter, you have to you design in Inkscape and then you import to the vinyl cutter software. Uh, same with the wood C and C. So there's there's actually easel is the example I'm using. There's other ways to use uh, vectors for that. Uh, Waterjet also you're importing it to the proprietary software, but all your design work can be done in Inkscape. Um, so what does that look like? So on the C and C machine, uh, you would go up to the import on top. There's the option for SVG that's circled. Your object comes in, and then you see the preview of uh, what it will look like when it's cut. And in the bottom corner, you see an example of the types of things people cut. Uh, with the water jet, uh, it's very similar. Again, you're coming to a vector-based line drawing, uh, which can be turned into a tool path inside of the, uh, the software for the tool. And then here's an example of what it looks like taking a two-dimensional object to 3D. So in the large picture, this is Tinkercad, a 3D design software that's on the web. Uh, you can see there's an SVG, which has a lot of, uh, or STL, which has lots of types of uh, objects in three dimensions. That's the orange object. And then we have something from Inkscape imported, which is an extruded 2D object. So you have some limitations because it's just stretching out that 2D object, 
but remember you can rotate, lift, manipulate it uh, in order to make a more complex 3D object. So it's a great way to get a fundamental shape uh, into your three-dimensional 3D design for 3D printing. Um, so what is Inkscape? Inkscape is simply a uh, user interface GUI, a graphic, graphical interface for folks to uh, be able to manipulate this underlying code in a way that is manageable to create complex shapes. Um, the, uh, it's all the standard, the SVG standard is run by a uh, consortium, uh, the WC3 uh, or 3C. Um, Inkscape itself is open source, it's free, it's developed by uh, volunteers. And so you can get into the code. It often means that the software itself is has more quirks. The user interface is maybe a little odder or unfamiliar. But one of the things that's amazing is it has a tremendous amount of flexibility where you can modify, program, add extensions to it. For example, I was making a board game and added an extension that allowed me to do essentially a mail merge with vector graphics, where then I could generate lots of player cards based on a spreadsheet and other other variables. Uh, so that's kind of a, a unusual thing, but there was other people in the community of Inkscape users who had decided that was an important thing to use. Uh, so I'm gonna go through these tools and then we're gonna get a, a chance to try them out. Uh, so this is the Bezier. Uh, you can see this is what the icon at the top is what the uh, that tool uh, it looks like. And what it does is it allows you to uh, draw objects uh, by clicking one after the other. So I'm going to use this tool and it will draw straight lines. But if I hold down the button, I'll get this additional uh, ability to manipulate the line and it will create a curve for me. Then in order to finish the object, so I can leave it as just an open line or I can come back to the beginning point and it will snap to it. If I click it there, we now have an enclosed object. Uh, so next I will go into uh, the object selection and fill. So now that we have this object, what I want to do is I want to be able to select it and fill it. One of the key distinctions in Inkscape that really gets beginner users confused is there's two sets of arrows here. Um, it's intuitive once you understand. So one is for selecting objects. This moves the whole thing. If there's multiple objects, I could uh, select those different objects. And if I change something with this, it is changing the whole object. This is for changing the elements within an object. If I try and click on it, it won't give me anything other than a selection tool. And that selection tool will allow me to grab individual parts of this object and then manipulate them. This is really useful if you wanted to, for example, extend something that had a clear breakpoint. You can extend it, manipulate it, and move those objects, those lines. You'll notice that there's grabbers on some of these uh, that allow you to change the character of the immediately adjoining lines. You'll also notice that there's several different shapes here. You have diamonds, you have squares. Uh, in some cases, we might end up with circles. Uh, what these do is they tell you the character of this junction. So a diamond being something that has sharp edges reminds us that this has a, uh, allows for a sharp turn. A square uh, having flat edges which intersect the line, uh, for me at least, are helpful to remember that this is a line that has these grabbers that uh, the line continues through that object. There's another type of rounding which is a circle and this circle uh, has, oh, did I change it to circle? So yeah, so you can create a circle. Oh, and it changed to the square afterwards. That's the circle rounds the position until you start modifying it. So let's, let's circle this right here. So now we have a circle for that uh, rounded edge. 
and we can make it a square and start manipulating uh, what's there. And if we take it to a diamond, now those two are disconnected and we're allowed to have a sharp corner on that, uh, that object. Further, you might find that uh, you need to add a node to something. So if you select two nodes or any number of nodes, you can go up to this little plus node and it will add a, another node at that center point. I can choose how I want that node to behave. I'm gonna make it a diamond and I'm going to create a little bump here. So you can see how uh, the, the object tool, which moves objects, full objects, very different than the node manipulation tool. And the node manipulation tool has a lot of sub tools this contextual bar that pops up, and there's a lot more that I won't get into, but those are the tools that I use most frequently um, that allows you to manipulate the object. Uh, now I wanna show you how you can add a fill to this, uh, a fill color. At the very bottom of the page, there's two things called fill and stroke. If you double click them, it will pop up with this side panel. Now, sometimes uh, that side panel will not be obvious, and that's most often because it's docked to the side. This is like one of the most common things that confuse new people to this, is they're clicking that, they're like, where is it, where is it, where is it? It is here, you click it on the side and it will pop up. The other thing that can happen is that there's other dockable tools, and so your tool could be scrolling down the side here. So you can close the toolbox, talk, toolboxes above it, uh, to be able to find your fill and stroke. Uh, to use this, you simply select the object that you're gonna fill, uh, and this is a characteristic of the object. And then you can click on what type of fill, these are various gradients and patterns, and you can select the color that you want. There's various different methods of uh, selecting that color so that you can get uh, something that you're happy with. And then A is an alpha channel. Alpha is for transparency, so you can see through the object. Uh, let's, uh, I think that's enough of that. Uh, so this is an example of uh, moving nodes around, and as I, as I did, uh, impacting the line and taking things out. So for example, if you had a badly drawn state of Connecticut, you could go ahead and cut out that, uh, that notch. So I'm gonna say, why don't we uh, stop for a moment here? Why don't you all try and use the Bezier tool to draw a badly drawn Connecticut without the notch, and then, uh, and then add the notch. Uh, if you're able, share your screen uh, so that we can see your progress uh, as you're going along. So the, there's a question about which one is the Bezier tool. You can hover over each of the tools and it will tell you what tool it is on the side uh, in a little yellow box, but there's a pencil above it and it's kind of like, a, it looks like a modified pen or it looks like a mechanical pencil, I guess, drawing a line. It's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. It's about uh, 10 or 12 icons down along the sidebar. All right. Uh, let me know how people are uh, doing. Okay, cool. I'm seeing, uh, I'm watching Stuart draw his.
that looks like a badly drawn Connecticut to me. It's, yeah, that's good enough. So I think the point is, if you now can go over to the node uh, selection tool, the one that's the second arrow down on the sidebar. Yep. Uh, so now you have the nodes. So highlight those top two nodes. You can highlight um, either by holding shift or by uh, clicking outside of the nodes and then dragging a selection box around them. Okay, now you got them both selected. Now go up at the very top bar, there is a little picture of a plus sign over a uh, node in the corner. Yep, if you click that. Uh, and so I would click it again. Um, all right, so now you have enough. Um, you can use start pulling. Uh, now right now it'll move all of them at once because they're all selected, right? But what you wanna do is just select whatever ones you wanna move. Um, and so I would pull down that center node, for example, to start to make your notch. Yep, so now you have a like a V notch. So you have to add yet another node between the two of the ones to be able to get it to look more like a square. Oh, yeah, see, because you have them all selected, yeah. Perfect. So I think folks who are uh, watching Stuart's screen have seen him successfully go through uh, modifying uh, the fundamental shape like that. Um, I'm going to move back to our presentation um, in order to keep us uh, keep us rolling. One second here while I set up the screen share. All right. So the, the next thing I want to do is get you guys to be able to create some basic shapes. Uh, we're going to create a, uh, a square, and then we're going to create a square with rounded corners. So uh, let me do that. We'll close here. So the square object is like five down. It's this one with a uh, gradient in it. And it's as simple as clicking and then dragging. And then here's the uh, trick to it. You have these corners, so you can continue to manipulate the square, but you also can grab this special circle corner and that will start rounding the corners. So it's uh, useful in creating rounded frames and, and things like that. Uh, so go ahead and uh, why don't you guys all try and create a square and then round the corner. All right, well, uh, if you didn't get a chance to do that, that's okay. We're gonna do some practice at the end. The next thing I wanna do is to uh, do circles. Circles as objects also have special characteristics. So, and there's a little bit of a trick to them. Just like the other ones, there's this, uh, the, these circle manipulators and a lot of times I've seen people that are like, what is it doing? There's a bug, it's jumping all over the place. Well, it looks like it has got a bug if you don't understand quite what's going on. So the circle, when you're inside of the circle, 
we'll draw a line that is crossing the uh, circle at some between those two points. So you can make a partial circle. If you move your cursor outside of it, that will include a point at the center, much like a pie chart. Uh, so it's that uh, combination of where your cursor is and where these two lines are that determine where the how the circle will be defined. Uh, next, an important concept to understand is uh, layers. So with layers, uh, sorry, with the object of rising and falling. So layers are a little something else, but uh, I'm going to make this yellow just to, to make it clear. These are all sitting and obstructing each other uh, one way or the other, and it might be important that we get the green one on top and the red one below. So we can move these objects. Uh, so they're objects all sitting in one layer right now, and I can raise that layer. So I'm going to raise it, and it just raised it above the red one, and I can raise that layer again, and as you see, it raised it above the yellow one. So you can play with where each of these objects are sitting within a layer. Um, there's also this concept of layers where you it's a, that's essentially a grouping or a, a collection of objects that can all have their own individual object position within a layer. But uh, for now, when you're just drawing, uh, it's default on one layer and you can manipulate where these are. For example, lower to the bottom is useful and that puts it all the way behind the other, uh, the other objects. Chair, we had a question from Stuart. If you could demonstrate um, how to make a circle with a set um, radius length. Yeah, uh, I'll have to refresh myself, but uh, so when you're making a circle, uh, one of the things you can do, I'm just trying to remember how to do it. You can hold down control or shift, Control. So control does, uh, uh, and my, on my computer it's alt. So different computers does different things. Um, and so if you hold down shift, you work from the center. Uh, and then, so we have that. Let me, uh, we go to the circle tool. So as long as circle tool is selected and it's on your circle, you have these two options at the top, which are radius X and radius Y. And we're working in millimeters right now. So if I want a, a 15 uh, radius Y and a 15 radius X, it's going to give me that. Now, of course, I've already added modifiers to it. Um, and I think I can manipulate those with these. So now i am uh, got finer tuned control. And there's some additional uh, contextual controls at the top here related to this circle. Uh, Inkscape is really deep, and so there's probably a whole lot that I don't uh, understand yet, uh, but that should hopefully give you the ability to at least get a perfect circle by controlling the X and Y uh, dimensions. Let me know if you need more. Um, text. So text is a tool on the sidebar. Because I zoomed my screen in so you could see things better, uh, it doesn't show that tool on my toolbar, but yours should be pretty obviously a picture of some like letters. Uh, it'll give you this, and then you can say, uh, you could click on something and type. Hello. Uh, like the other ones, there's a contextual uh, tools for that. Oh, in this case, I have to select it and then change the font. And I can actually, once font is selected, I can go through and just scroll through and see those fonts in place. Uh, I can change the size. I can change spacing. And so there's a, there's a whole selection of text modifying tools. But the way that you start your text matters. So if I had done this, which was selected a box first, I would now be constrained to a text box. 
And as I type, it will uh, page over uh, in order for that text that's filling the space to be constrained to that box, where the other one will just keep going uh, forever and only break to the next line if you were to uh, use the enter key and break to the next line. When you're editing this as an object, it will stretch and modify. When you go down and you're using the text editing tool first, you're in that text mode, you can come back and actually modify the text. You can also modify the uh, size of the text box without modifying the object overall. So it takes a little bit of getting used to uh, working with text since it is not um, it's not a regular object. Show uh, us, can you show us how to change the font again? Yeah. So in order to change the font, so the biggest confusion is when people are in the object mode. So right now you're not going to change the font because all it cares about is this as a zoomed out object. You have to go to the text tool inside of your sidebar here, click text. And now you can click on any of the areas that have text and you have to highlight that area that you're going to change. Uh, so what, what do you want to change the text of? And now you can go and select fonts and you can actually use your up and down keys on your keyboard to uh, quickly go through and preview what it looks like. like that one looks crazy um, on your, on your screen. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, another note about um, that I'll bring up as far as text goes when you're in the object mode, it might is sometimes useful to rotate something. So when clicking on an object, when you click on the center, you're moving it around. And these control boxes allow you to scale it. Holding down shift, control, and alt or these other keys modify how you're scaling it. And clicking it again. Uh, brings up a different set of these control boxes. These are for rotation. So you can rotate and then you can change your center of rotation by moving this. And so now it's going to rotate around this new center. Uh, useful for uh, positioning texts when you're making flyers and, and all sorts of things. Let me see. Uh, oh, grouping. So an important concept is to be able to, a lot of times, a bunch of things are together. You've carefully positioned this yellow and red thing, but you need to adjust it relative to the green. So what I will do is I can hold down the shift key on the keyboard and click the second object. I've now selected two objects and I can go up to this object menu and I can group. These now, whenever I click them, they live together and get moved around together. Uh, sometimes grouping is a problem. When you go and you try and change, I want to fix my yellow. I'm like, all right, I want yellow now to be a different, I want that to be green. I click green, I'm like, what's going on? It made my other object change as well because you're applying it to the full group. So what you have to do now when you want to work with something in the group is you have to go back in and you have to ungroup. Uh, which is under object and then ungroup and now i can unselect both i can select the object i want and i can change the specific color that i want uh, so grouping and ungrouping is important it's also one of the things that gives people a lot of trouble when laser cutting because when you export something from illustrator or not a lot of other programs it will have groups within groups within groups. So what I mean by that is this has been grouped and then for some, whatever reason, the way the software is working, it says, okay, so that's a group, but that group should also be inside of this group. And so now uh, that is a group uh, and then it has another group here. And so you can actually use control G and control U to group and ungroup. Uh, you'll find that handy to use the hotkeys once you start doing it a lot. Uh, well, now 
you've got a pretty complex object and the way that the laser cutter drivers work, it gets confused about where objects are in the tree and it will just look at the top object or will look at none of the object. So I will often use control U to ungroup, ungroup, ungroup when uh, I'm working with the laser cutter. So everything is just ungrouped in that final version. JR, we had a question from Julia um, going back to the text. Uh, she's wondering how to make curved text. Can you show that <laughs> editing that way? Yeah, so you know that's something I've done, uh, but I always have to look it up before I do it. Uh, it is something like you draw one of these uh, Beziers, and then you click one. Oh, I actually have to draw the Bezier. I, I'm just going to try it, and if it doesn't work, uh, we're going to we're just going to go on to the next thing. But I'll I'll, I'll give it a college try for you. Uh, so there's our like our line, and I think you do something like you select this, and then you select the line as the target. And then you go to text, put on path. There we go. Um, so that's what you do. You draw a line of some kind. And then I should be able to now to remove that line. Uh, do I have to ungroup it? Oh, no. What for? I have to change it. Because right now, I think it's actually living with the line. So I can continue to uh, manipulate this and make it really fun and funky. Um, but then I should be able to go to the stroke and just make it the line invisible. Yeah, so that line will still exist, but now it's invisible unless you're editing it. Hopefully, that, hopefully that's enough to get you started. Um, cool. So we're actually doing relatively well on, um, on time. Uh, so what I think I'm going to ask folks to do is to participate in, um, we're not going to, I won't have people actually reproduce this exact thing, but I'm going to have you make your own little collage with a combination of, uh, these different shapes, a square that's square, sharp corners, circles that have been cut at different angles, maybe a bezier, and then put them at different uh, angles. So just play with those uh, for a moment and, uh, and ask me questions. So yeah, I'll actually open it for verbal questions as you guys are, uh, as you guys are working on that and feel free to share your screen as you're working on that as well. JR, um, Julia did have a question that I um, answered over in the comments, but at some point it may be helpful for other people um, about when you're using the node tool on circles. Um, yeah. Once you start kind of messing with the circle, it leaves you with what I call sort of the Pac-Man or whatever shape you've made. Um, yeah. And how to sort of restore that. Um, I showed her sort of the top menu and things like that, but that might be a helpful thing, how to get back into just straight circle mode, if that makes sense. If not, I can share my screen and, and then do it. Uh, yeah, why don't you share your screen since you were working specifically on it? And I don't know offhand. I would actually just be kind of experimenting. Yeah, yeah so my, mine was just kind of um, experimenting as well. Um, but let me see if I can get the correct thing to present here. This thing. I'm presenting my screen. Let's see. Um, are we seeing this? Yep. Um, so basically what, what I said, and this is what I um, discovered just by, by messing around with it a little bit, is so here you can see I have my little Pac-Man. And um, if I'm making another circle, it just keeps making Pac-Man or whatever I've added it to. Um, so if you look up here, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Um, I can change the start and end both to be zero, and that will complete it. Um, so I'm again in the circle tool doing that. Um, or if I um, haven't done that, I can also use these buttons up here, and it yeah. says you can make it whole. So if you ever find yourself stuck in the shape that you've made, um, 
within the circle tool, that's where you want to do that. Thanks, Kate. I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, so when we're using the Bezier tool to make all these Bezier points, um, you can go all the way around back to the starting point, click there, and that ends it. But can you just end it? Uh, do you have to close it in order to end it? Yeah, you do not have to close it. Uh, you can end it by hitting the Enter key, and it will commit it as a line at that point. I believe you can also double click uh, and it will end it, though I try it and see if that works. Yep. yep. Both worked. All right, thank you. Actually, I should have known because that's exactly how it works in uh, Illustrator. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, other questions? Yep, I got the Bezier question. Uh, so hopefully folks are uh, going forward with the um, with their experimentation. I'm going to jump into the next uh, level of more advanced tools. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through these more quickly uh, so you guys don't aren't necessarily following along. And then we'll have uh, an open period for questions and answers and for you to continue to do some work. And uh, I can troubleshoot that work as you play with these, these tools and concepts. Uh, so let me uh, share my screen again. And we, were, we will be away to the races. So the advanced tools that, um, oh, object to path uh, is, is one. So the thing about the circles and the squares right now is you can't, for example, modify one uh, corner. So the uh, problem I'm talking about is you now have this nice object, but you want one corner to be squared. Uh, and because it's a tool where all of the parts are connected, you cannot uh, modify just one corner. So it, this becomes time to go from an object to a path. So objects are things that have specially defined characteristics, like a circle that has a radius and you can modify it and have the Pac-Man thing happen. Uh, when you want to start manipulating it beyond that, you now have to just turn it into a plain path, which is a definition of lines, much like just the standard SVG definition. And so that is right up here, object to path. You'll notice that when I go now into the node editor, that rather than having something that uh, is going to change at all, it's just as if it was a Bezier drawn tool uh, object. Uh, I now can change each node and work with each point. Uh, the same is true of our circle. So right now the circle is a special object with special behaviors. And when I go up to object to path, it is now a standard object that can be uh, changed and manipulated uh, like, like any of the other objects. Um, the layers and union. So you can get more complex by, uh, so let's say I wanted to take a byte out of this object here with this object here. Um, I will typically, let's assume we're working with paths in, in both cases. So both are paths. And I'm going to overlap these two. I'm going to select one, then the other. And then I'm going to go to difference. I'll just do that again so you can see uh, what I did. So I moved one object. It's on top of the other. I select the second one so that we have both objects selected. And I'm going to go up to path. And a path actually has a number of different things I can do. So I could combine them into one complete object. Uh, I'm using the top object in this case, like a cookie cutter to take it out. I could do the intersection where the two touch and only keep that part. Uh, I can do a division, which actually creates the three objects and it removes the bigger one, but creates two little objects. Well, let's do that. Let's create a little corner, rounded corner piece. So it's removed that. But now I have the, the, I have to select it, the sliced piece of my circle 
has been removed. Uh, again, this is really useful when you are, uh, you have a shape that you've traced and you want to move it from like a frame uh, for something you're going to laser cut, well, you can now make it uh, actually cut that out of the shape rather than a lot of people who are really new to this will like, rather than actually cutting something out, they'll just take something and then make it white and be like, look, it's gone. Well, it's not gone. In fact, it's, it's still there. And the laser cutter, it might confuse the laser cutter. It will cut the line behind there because it doesn't see that it's cut it out. Um, one way you can do that is if you go up to view and then display mode, uh, we're in normal right now, but we could also look at the outline mode. Uh, the outline shows you what the actual vector lines that are plotted are. And in so this case, it reveals that this object is one where it's just one is hiding, uh, obscuring the true line. And this one has actually been cut and defined a new object. Now I will go back to display mode normal. Um, so, okay, so we covered, uh, so layers. So we covered objects and how they sit relative to each other inside of a particular layer. Um, but there's also this idea of layers. So you can add a whole new layer, um, you know, I, I guess, Layer two is as good as anything. So we're gonna put this layer uh, above the current. And so now um, I am on this layer. So I can add layers, I can show hide current layers, I can switch above, I can go to the layer tool, which allows me to select which layer I'm on. Uh, so I can start drawing multiple objects on layer two. Oh, let's let's use something other than uh, so I've, I've I've gone and I'm drawing my layer two objects. They can all have different sorting within that, and then I can say hide all of them, or I can say lock them so that they don't get manipulated. Uh, my only caution with layers is it's great for uh, segmenting a complex design, uh, although it can, when importing to different tools for tools paths it can cause some confusion. This will vary depending on the tool and what you're importing to. So you might find that you have to uh, recombine your layers into one, depending on what software you're ultimately exporting it to. Um, there Was there a question? Yeah. So yeah. Um, is there a, uh, if you're going to be using, say, the laser cutter, filling it, the object in with a uh, color is meaningless. What what what's the best way to handle the objects that's going to the laser cutter? Just make them transparent. Actually, it's not meaningless. So the way that the laser cutter works is it uses color to assign power and operation. So the key when you're using the laser cutter is if you're like, I want this to be filled in red, uh, is to be sure that you've gone to your fill menu and you have your fill, uh, for example, be the full 255 of transparency because it will confuse it if you have uh, transparency in it. You want it fully opaque. Um, and then I'll typically go here and if I want it to be a cutting, I'll normally use red as my cutting color. Um, and so you can define a line or a fill uh, with various colors. So it may not look visually appealing, but for laser cutter, you are thinking about each full color as a, uh, a way to assign an operation. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, let's do a, a bitmap trace. So uh, I'm gonna jump over and I'm gonna grab, uh, I'll open a new tab. Uh, Google Chrome, and we're going to go to Makehaven, and I'm going to grab the uh, banner from this event, uh, and it has that cute little robot on it that I that I want. So I'm now going to go back to Inkscape. I'm going to paste it in here, and what we have 
is uh, an encapsulated or a, a pixelated image. So this is a series of pixels. It's a bitmap or a raster. Uh, it's like a graph that just has a bunch of dots on it. It's not a vector drawing. If we went to look at it uh, to see what the lines were within it in the outline mode, we see it just shows up as a big X because there, there are no lines in it. So if I want to extract something for laser cutting uh, as a line on it or water jet cutting or CNCing, uh, I need to find a way to convert this to a vector. Fortunately, there's a tool built into the system and that is uh, right up here. It's under path and it is a uh, trace bitmap. So I'm gonna trace this bitmap. It brings up a dialog box. Uh, one thing by default, it doesn't preview it. So I think I'm gonna preview it. And I'm just gonna use the most simple way to isolate and that's a brightness cutoff. So uh, you can see if I brightness zero is there at uh, a very low cutoff, you're only getting the darkest colors or the darkest shades. And then as we go, it brings more into the mix. So I'm going to target getting that little robot. And so, uh, you know, just estimating right there looks like a good cutoff. So I'm going to say OK. And what will have happened is it will have added a, another uh, a traced object on top of that rat bitmap that I had selected. So now I can view it, display mode outline. And we can see we, in fact, have a uh, traced image. Uh, let's, uh, let's further manipulate it. So I can go to the node editor. I can get rid of all of this stuff I don't want by just selecting and then hitting the delete key. I can, so I'm selecting using a drag and the delete key. We now have it down to our little robot. Now, unfortunately, you can only get as much detail as is there. Um, the, the outline, the little robot that we imported had barely has antenna. And so the way we were tracing it just didn't pick it up. So you might find some limitations. You can tweak it, however. So if you trace the bitmap, we can come in here. And in addition to this uh, tracing, we can say whether we're suppressing, whether we're smoothing. So I'm going to remove smoothing and path optimization. This will give me a more complex path. Um, I'm going to take smooth off here. So this will result in something that's more jagged, uh, but might retain some of the detail. Uh, so I'm going to try that. I'm going to go to my node editing to get rid of the superfluous stuff. You see it's a lot more complex. Let's, uh, let's see what that one looks like next to it. Well, not so much. We did, it does look more jagged, but we didn't really pick up the antenna. So you have to, you have to play with these, uh, with these things. Uh, there's other things you can do, such as tracing by color. Um, and you can say uh, how many colors you want. Uh, this is great to do for images. Um, it can give you sort of a, 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 that, a Barack Obama believe thing. So let me just go with the, I'm going to look for a portrait image. Copy image. Okay, so right there. So there she is. And so if I want to take that down to eight colors, I can say there. And so now we have eight colors. What's interesting is these are all actually grouped, but I can ungroup them all and start to um, break out the individual components and start uh, manipulating and recombining those as, as we see fit. So, you know, that's just a, uh, a side project that uh, you can do, but each of those then becomes uh, something that you could use um, to cut a uh, design and extract, you know, the, the essence or a cutout of an image, pulling parts from one or the other in order to uh, get the effect that you want. Um, 
let me go back to uh, Phil. So one of the really common problems is uh, you have something that's really hard to trace, but it's contained. And so a great tool is the paint bucket. Uh, it's not showing it as a paint bucket on mine, but it looks like a paint bucket. And all you do is you select a color and it will fill in a spot. What's neat is it fills it in as a new object. So now I can grab this and it's essentially like tracing. So that would be another way to get the robot. Uh, it would be to go, let's see if that works any better. I doubt it will because those antenna are just tough. Uh, but we're going to go paint bucket. Um, and yeah, so the paint bucket didn't work. Now I can uh, change the paint bucket. So I'm going to go back to my paint bucket. And let's, what do we say? Threshold, we'll turn down the threshold. Uh, I'll turn up the threshold. Uh, turn up the threshold. You know, that seems a little better. Um, so you could start to manipulate the, uh, the paint bucket settings to be able to also fill a uh, organic thing and then get your object outlined. And like all the tools, the paint bucket has various, uh, various modifiers uh, at the, on the above space. Distribution and alignment. So uh, say we have a bunch of tools, a bunch of things, and we want them spaced evenly. This is very common, more frequently when you have things that are the same uh, size, like you're trying to align holes on something. And uh, this is under object. And we go to align and distribute. And there's a whole bunch of things. So if we want them all along the, the line, which is the lowest object, now they're all sitting along a line. If we all want them spaced on their center point, we can click this. And so they're all to their center point. Um, but we have different sized objects, so that's not useful. It doesn't care what the space is between them. We could say, make the spaces between them the same amount of space between them, no matter what the size of the object is. So each one of these is doing that in a different way. These are doing it horizontally, vertically, and so on. Um, and we can align, well, this will uh, make them all aligned to a center line. So there's lots of ways to align and distribute. Uh, you could do random. There's uh, ways of doing, so just one other distribution, which is sort of advanced, but I'll, I'll show you guys. If we wanted to tile things, we could say um, clone. Uh, clone right here. So then uh, create clone or create tile. Um, oh, wait. Clone, uh, create tiled clones. And now you can get crazy with shifting things, moving them. Uh, and so if I say create, I've created a tile, tiling of all of these. In this case, I'm mirroring each other one. So this is a great way to make patterns. Uh, you can also, because if you shift each one by one degree, you can make patterns that circle and do all sorts of intricate things that are awesome for laser cutting. Um, what else did I say I was going to teach you? Ah, the last thing is the XML editor. So when you're going deep into troubleshooting and you have objects that don't make sense, uh, let's do these and I'll group these two. What you can do is you can go to edit and then down to this XML editor. So this shows you that code. I originally talked about uh, this shows you what's going on under the hood. So each Inkscape is assigning names to these different objects. So this grouped object uh, has this ID. So I can call it my shape group. Right? Now, now this, is, uh, this is now called shape group. And uh, the objects under here, I could call this, uh, you could see, I gotta expand my window a little bit. But you can see all the characteristics of the shape, color, 
Um, this is a definition of all of the points that as far as uh, what points on the coordinate plane it's going to. Uh, there's the ID. So we're going to call this uh, JR's shape. Um, so this allows us uh, a lot of understanding of what's happening. It also, it allows you to go in. I find it useful if I'm having a lot of trouble with something, I can come in here and see like what's going on. Is this grouped? Is it a bunch of tiny little paths that come in as all little separate line segments? What's, what's happening uh, can often be revealed by going in and looking at the code that underlies it. I understand it's also intimidating and may not be uh, what most people use, but it's good to know that fundamentally when you save your file, this is the text that gets saved. That's what you're manipulating. All of the icons, all of the things uh, in this user interface are for the purpose of manipulating that XML file and you can go down and see it. It will also, when you click an object and you have that dialogue open, it'll also jump to that object. Um, that takes me to the end of my presentation and I'm at three minutes past the hour. So uh, I think we are appropriately timed to be in our questions and answers and to uh, see, see what you guys have left to create. I'm just going to jump in and just let everyone know. Um, I think JR has some time to stick around if you have um, individual questions or if you want to play around a little bit, but stay on so that as questions come up, um, you can get them answered. I did put a note um, in the the text um, to everyone with our um, with the links to the evaluation as well as the link to our um, general feedback for what kind of workshops you guys want to see. Um, so I just want to make sure everyone saw that and um, and thank you for coming out and learning with us. And if you can do both of those, um, that gives us a lot of good information. And back to Inkscape. Great. So uh, what questions do you have? You can ask by text or by, uh... yeah. So uh, Stuart's having trouble tracing a picture. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to help you. So the basic steps are, it has to be a, a bitmap that you bring in. Uh, that bitmap, you have to select it with the object select tool. So if it's not selected, it won't work. Uh, and then while that is selected, you go up to the uh, path and then trace bitmap. And uh, you remember to click the little preview button to sort of help yourself orient to it. Uh, if you want to share your screen, Stuart, uh, I'm happy to take a look at what you're doing. And I might be able to identify where you're having a problem. Um, All right, so I'm looking at Stuart. Um, oh, and Julie asked if there's a recording. Yes, there's a recording, and uh, I'm going to post it to YouTube. Um, you know, probably 20 minutes after this, after the the image or the the video processes. So this is all going to be recorded. Um, so this, this isn't a bitmap, though. I think I brought uh, this in from somewhere else, but it it does this. So yeah, I, so one way to know if it's a bitmap is you can go to the node editor tool, and if you see nodes on it, then you know it's not a uh, bitmap. Yeah, so that's already a vector, so the tracing it does nothing. It has to be a bitmap to start. Can I delete some of these vectors? Uh, some of the nodes? Sure you can. Uh, so all you need to do is uh, click and highlight. And now you can hit the delete key, and it will uh, delete them. Uh. Yeah. I think you can also highlight. I think you can also click the like node minus at the top as a tool. Uh, I find it easier to intuitive enough to remember to hit the delete key. But there's also, I think, the, uh, the button. So now I could uh, laser that onto a piece of wood, right? Yeah, absolutely, you could. Uh, and what you would do for lasers, you would define the outline. Uh, and so you would make sure that you know what is cutting the cutout versus what is cutting a raster, um, which would be the fill. So that gets right. more into like the laser specifics, which I'll leave for laser cutting 
uh, orientation stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, there you go. Uh, I see Jeremy said he learned a lot and thank you. I'm glad Jeremy that you could join us and that you learned a lot. Uh, keep playing with Inkscape. It does take a little bit to learn, but it's great uh, free software that you know, is universally, uh, you know, that universal nature of SVG as a format means that it's a powerful thing to be able to manipulate. Other uh, other questions. So, Rich, you said something about auto trace versus manual trace, um, and yeah. So, trace the bitmap is, I guess, auto trace. I'm, uh, that might be what they call it in Illustrator. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So, a lot of times, you could um, in Illustrator anyway, you could bring in an image and rather do an auto trace, which was always even in Illustrator you know, kind of uh, imprecise. But if you zoom into the, the bitmap, you can then use the Bezier tool and just very carefully go around the whole object until you get it to a NAS butt and it's perfect. So you do yeah. it manually rather than auto trace. I don't know if you could do that in here or not. Yeah, you absolutely can. So what I might do is I might use the, um, the, the trace from a bitmap uh, or the fill first to get the basic shape. And then you can go around and create additional Bezier tools as separate or Bezier shapes. And then you can just use the merge tool. So remember how you highlight the two. And so that way you can tweak and add to it with uh, while having the starting point of the automatic tracing and the advantage of your, uh, of your manual manipulation. So you get both. Uh, well, Julia said that uh, it'd be super cool if we could re reconvene at a future time. Yeah, like I'd be happy to do some lab hours, so to speak, um, where we uh, pop in and I try and answer questions. It'd also be great for other people with more experience because uh, you will stump me on some Inkscape questions. I, I certainly do not know it all by any uh, stretch of the imagination. Uh, and, and learn something every time I play with it. So uh, maybe that's something we set up as, as an event and just all do a virtual Inkscape thing. It'd be cool to kind of have some challenges maybe, like some create of this, create of that, um, just so that we have some ideas uh, for how we could, you know, be on the same page. Got Logos, yeah, we could do some logo design. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely open to it. It's just a matter of uh, us putting it on the, the calendar. And then you guys could also do, we could set it up so you could do a unfacilitated meetup. Uh, so you're not dependent on me uh, as, a, as a stopping point. Yeah, C Catan tiles are very cool. Um, I also had, uh, if, you, if you guys have ever played uh, Carcassonne, uh, I was making Carcassonne tiles. Uh, or Carcassonne styled tiles uh, as a uh, as a project. How do I go back to it? Lots of lots of things you could do. So other other questions as we uh, as we wrap up. Anybody have a problem that they just really got stumped with and want to share their screen and see if I can um, help them get unstuck? No, but I have a, a an idea. Um, I would like to uh, trace out the make haven robot and extrude it uh in pieces separate arms uh separate legs and the body shape and have it fit the micro bit little robot thing that we're making it wouldn't be the first extrusion would probably be very not exactly right and it would all it's but it would be getting close <laughs> eventually yep. i like plug in all the parts into yep. 3d um Back, backbone, so to speak. Uh, anyway, I yeah. So we have a we share. I think it's on the member resources. We share a uh, design design files for the Makehaven logos and the robot. So the best thing is always because you don't lose anything converting, but you know, moving SVGs around because it's the mathematical plotted lines, and you can scale up and down without losing detail. So that's why it's often used in. Um, commercial situations. And I would say for a logo that we want to keep crisp or something you want to modify like that, grab the SVG from our um, our little archive there 
and uh, start manipulating it. Uh, you can use those tools that I showed you where you break apart. So I would break the arms off maybe, and then I would create a gear shape and then add that. So you, you could start really um, playing with it and manipulating it. There is, so Inkscape's amazing in a lot of ways. There is a point at which you're better off going to something like AutoCAD when you're doing real, you know, interoperable mechanical uh, things. There's also some open source versions of that type of software. Uh, so there is a kind of a limit to Inkscape, uh, but you you can you can go a long way before you hit start hitting those mechanical uh, problems where perhaps you need the mathematical tools that are associated with. Um, with Inkscape. Uh, there's also, I believe that there's a built-in gear generator in Inkscape. Um, do you want to see that? I can pop over and see if you, uh, I'll show you that too. A gear generator. So let me, uh, let me share my screen. This is all bonus. People can jump out when they feel, don't feel obligated to stay. Um, so I'll share my screen again. Mm. And I could, I, I'm, I'm going from memory here. Here. But I think it is um, under like render, render, and we want to render a gear. Uh, we'll just render a single gear. And so how many teeth do you want? We'll do 20 teeth, like 20 that. pitch, all of this. Uh, let's look at a preview of that. Ha! <laughs> Error. Okay, so I don't know. You're... you're um, your mileage may vary. Uh, sometimes things break in updates. Smaller. You have to do what? If you have 20 teeth at 22 size pitch, it's going to be too big. You need like a one, and it's probably in inches, right? Yeah, well, yeah. So I was saying pixels, units, millimeters. Let me. Our, our servos yeah. have, a, have a small gear on them. It'd be great if we can use that to mesh. To the arms and legs in our yeah. uh, prototype well so i guess this is uh an example of when you start getting deep into the features of inkscape you will run into python errors from time to time uh for the most part uh, so i think i actually am not on the most recent version uh so you can always look at what version so i'm on 92.3 so i think they're on 92.4 so maybe they fixed the gear uh, maybe there's something weird in the file that I'm doing or I'm doing now to break it. But uh, that is the pro and the con of Inkscape or open source software is often that you have these communities that add all sorts of features like gear generation. And from time to time, those will break. Um, so hey, in this case, this, so can we get broken. this operating on uh, Raspbian? On Inkscape? Uh, I, I believe so. It might be slow. But uh, I, I would think that uh, you could handle it on uh, on a Raspberry Pi, especially the new Raspberry Pi is no problem. I'll definitely be giving it a try. Yeah. Did anybody else get a gear to work? Um, or was it just me or? Thanks a lot, JR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you could do a rack and pinion. So I haven't explored that. Uh, I think that's a great, uh, Julie, if you want to try, see if you can generate some gears and see what it'll do. Oh, so where are the gears again? Um, gears are, uh, it's on extensions. This is where all the crazy stuff is. And then it's under render. So it's like, what are the things that you want to render? Um, like it has barcodes and calendars and all kinds of things. And then there's gears. And then there's uh, gear and gear rack. Um, I can just try applying. Yeah, I don't know what the. Maybe you should click on that. There. Well, here it is up here. Okay. Yeah. So somebody else try. Just see if it's if is it just me or. You got it. Oh, Stuart got it. So uh, I don't know. It's something. It's something wrong with mine, or maybe it's my particular version that I haven't updated to the most recent. Um, and you can look into other things. You can also add extensions. So when I created those uh, the cards for the board game. Uh, I went out and found a community that had an extension that they had built and I copied it into Inkscape and uh, did that design. Um, another one that's out there, there's a uh, actually an embroidery for Inkscape 
where you can do uh, digital embroidery design. Um, and it is, uh, I found it a little too difficult to operate, but uh, I think for somebody willing and wanting that deeper control um, of being closer to the design stuff, being able to see the code, uh, there might be some attraction to using Inkscape to actually do uh, automated CNC embroidery designs as well. So, um, though I haven't explored it to the degree that I can recommend it yet. I, I, found I got a little stuck on it. Uh, but those are both things that you add as uh, extensions where you're dragging files into the into folders that then add features to Inkscape. So advanced, advanced usage. So with the uh, seeing that we sort of come to the end of questions, uh, I'm going to do a last call for any assistance, any other questions. Um, and Julia got the rack option to work. Awesome. Uh, keep experimenting and uh, keep sharing. Um, you know, you can always post things on our uh, community Slack channel too as you uh, figure them out and uh, other people might be able to build on your ideas. Um, as we figure out how the closure due to the COVID crisis happens, um, we, if it's extended, we might look at ways that we can uh, have a single operator do water jet cutting or other things. So uh, do think about what design work you have and want, and we're going to get you in there to do it as soon as possible um, and look for intermediate options if, um, if it's not possible. I have, uh, so, have a quick request. Yeah. The next person in the space could they water the plants? <laughs> <laughs> you know where you know the ones I'm talking about. Yeah, send send a Leor's in the space uh, pretty frequently, so let's send him a message. Okay. Um, but with that, uh, if there's no other Inkscape related questions, um, I am going to thank you all for attending, and uh, bid you adieu. Thank you. Great. Recording will be shared uh, shortly. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.